Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Wild stuff to talk about today. All right, so in this unit, what we've been talking about and what we will continue to talk about is challenges to American ideals. Uh, times throughout American history where these rules, expectations, and ideals we have created for ourselves as a country and all the people in it, uh, we have fallen short uh, and how we have tried to right those wrongs and how the people uh, that uh, have been failed by the United States government have actively fought in their own interest to meet the American ideals. So in this unit, uh, we're talking about African Americans and how the challenges throughout the history of the United States have directly affected uh, African Americans uh, where they were clearly discriminated against. We're also gonna be talking about uh, immigrants throughout the history of the United States. And we're gonna be talking about Native Americans uh, and how the United States has not lived up to the ideals of all men are created equal with those specific groups in, in, in this unit. Uh, there are other groups we'll talk about in other units, but this unit deals with those three specific groups. Uh, so we started out uh, in, in the first lesson talking about African Americans and slavery because you can't really talk about civil rights movement uh, without explaining slavery. So today we're gonna to pick up at the very end of the Civil War, slavery has ended, we have outlawed it, we, we've realized uh, that's pretty messed up, should never have done that. 13th Amendment, slavery is abolished. All right, uh, that's where we're gonna pick up today. Uh, let's get started. So the end of the Civil War, the United States of America, which is the North, used in the Civil War is the term, uh, the 13th Amendment is passed outlawing slavery in the North, all right? They are going to quickly, they being the United States, as the Confederate States of America is dismantled and brought back in, not only is slavery illegal, they're gonna pass the 14th Amendment, which makes all people in America equal. There's not ranks of citizens, this way you can't treat the freedmen, the, the slaves as second class citizens. All citizens are equal under, under the eyes of the law. And the 15th Amendment, which gives African Americans the right to vote, which is incredibly important. Once a group gains the right to vote, they are massively powerful because, as we have talked about in previous units, as soon as a group gets a right to vote, the United States government then cares about them. So freed slaves, and at this point it's still men because it's, it's in the 1860s, women won't get the right to vote until 1920. Uh, freed slaves have the right to vote. So, you know, on paper, fantastic, problem over, uh, ended slavery, it's illegal. The freed slaves, African Americans now are treated as, you know, equal citizens under the 14th Amendment, and then they have the right to vote. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Glad that's over. No. Uh, there is a massive pushback to allowing former slaves to be treated equal as whites, especially in the South, where the vast majority of African Americans live. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we had mentioned at the end of the last unit, or the last lesson, that there were these black codes that came out that tried to treat black people specifically as second class citizens. That gets thrown out with the 14th Amendment because you can't have certain laws for certain groups of people and not others. Because all citizens are equal. So that brings up the Jim Crow laws, is what we're going to start talking about today. Jim Crow laws are laws technically that apply to all people. However, the Jim Crow laws are specifically designed to prevent black people from having the same say-so in society as white people, especially in the South. So one of the ways the Jim Crow law affects everybody, all right, but directly targets African Americans is you have to prevent, say, if, if, if you're a racist person in the South and you do not want African Americans and the freed slaves to have a say in the government, uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is prevent them from voting because voting is incredibly powerful in our society. If you can vote, you control the government just as, as much as anybody else. So Jim Crow laws, all right, one of the things they do in the South is everybody now has to pay a poll tax. Now, a poll tax might be a nickel. You have to pay a nickel in order to vote. Now, the reason that negatively is going to impact African Americans is because guess who the poorest part of society is? African Americans. That nickel, all right, while it's not a lot of money, it basically is going to 
make an African-American family decide, are we going to vote today or are we going to have dinner? Since African-Americans were the poorest part of society because they were not allowed the same jobs as white people in the South after the Civil War, because of that, these poll taxes negatively impacted African-Americans more stringently than it would even poor whites. All right? Now, it, it's going to be hard on poor whites as well. All right? But the goal here is, is to prevent African-Americans from voting, to, to prevent black people from voting. And the poll tax, when everybody has to pay it, it will negatively impact the poorest part of the population, which at the time were freed slaves who had like zero dollars to their name. All right, so that, that was the first way, and it's a Jim Crow law because it technically applies to everybody. The second one is literacy test. Now, when I say a literacy test, you have to basically prove that you were literate before you're allowed to vote. All right, they want to make sure only educated people are voting. All right, well. From the get-go, just from that information that I'm telling you, uh, who was aggressively kept uneducated? It was slaves. So you'd be like, well, obviously that's going to keep them from voting because they, you know, a lot of slaves hadn't been taught how to read and write. So therefore, a literacy test, which applies to everybody, all right, will specifically target black people who were not allowed to read and write, all right, when they were slaves and they just got freed. So of course you know, they won't pass the literacy test, and you'd be correct on that. But it's even crazier than that. This here is an example of a Louisiana literacy test. Um, these questions have very little to do with literacy. Uh, the, uh, the question here is, draw in, a space, draw in the space below a square with a triangle in it. Then within the same triangle, draw a circle with a black dot in it. What? How is that literacy, reading and writing? Uh, this is very simple math. Who would have taught African Americans their shapes? As crazy as that sounds, all right? That is something that is, you don't just naturally know it, it's something that you learn in, in formal school. So I wanna make sure that African Americans can't pass these literacy tests. Here, here's what's even crazier, as, as there are math questions here, uh, uh, the question, print the word vote upside down, but in the correct order. All right, that, depend, that is subjective. So if it's upside down, but it's written backwards, okay, but if the person looking at this, this the correct order could be, no, it's upside down, but it had to be V-O-T-E, not E-T-O-V. It's just their opinion, all right? So these subjective tests, uh, basically you could isolate, so white people had to take the same test. You passed, but if a black person put the same answers the person grading it could be like, you didn't pass, which happened all the time. It's so ridiculous. If you got all these right and you're an African-American, there's specific instances of the grader just sliding aside and says, okay, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? What? Like, that seems ridiculous. That's real things that happen to real Americans to prevent them from voting. The literacy test was so unfairly administered to African-Americans it effectively helps black people not vote. It helps the, the, the racist white South at the time, all right? Because these are government laws, all right? This isn't just some guy, that, this is a government law. So while there are plenty of non-racist people in the South, for this to be the official law run in a state, in a democracy, it has to at least be the majority. It effectively keeps black people from voting, all right? Marginalizes black people who in some places like Mississippi were the majority of the population. Prevents them from voting. Uh, and by not allowing black people to have a voice in the state, it ends up being run by white people who are, design, who are designing the government to keep black people as second class citizens. Uh, so the question here is, describe what a literacy test was all right, and how it was not only unfair but had little to do with literacy, uh, and use specific examples. All right, now if it was just poll taxes and literacy tests that tried to prevent African Americans from voting, and that would have been successful. The problem is, there's a lot of really poor white people and very illiterate white people that we get caught up in that net of poll taxes and literacy tests. Because right? you had to apply poll taxes and literacy tests to everybody 
because you can't have laws just for one group of people based on the 14th Amendment. All right. So Jim Crow laws are unfair laws that apply to everybody. Well, here's how ridiculous the Jim Crow laws are uh, to make sure they only negatively impact African Americans. They start, meaning the South, starts to implement these things called grandfather clause, all right? Meaning, and you may have heard this, here is this common term we use now, doesn't have any racial connotation uh, present day. Uh, if you're grandfathered into something, it's like, hey, the, the rule changed, but you used to do it the old way, you just keep doing it the old way and you're good. Uh, it's a term we use all the time called, called you know, being grandfathered in. It comes from this concept of the grandfather clause. Here's what the grandfather clause is. Now, this applies to everybody. It says, if your grandfather could vote, you do not have to pay a poll tax or take a literacy test. You're exempt from those. This applies to everybody. Who's the only people who had grandfathers that could vote when this is passed in the 1860s and 70s? That's white people. So the grandfather clause basically exempts white people from having to pay the poll tax or take a literacy test. So even though this law applies to everybody, at the end of the day, who's the only group that has to pay a poll tax or take a literacy test? Is we African Americans because of the grandfather clause. Now, if you're like, man, I bet Mississippi back then, that was, that was awful, that was crazy, crazy racist. I'm sure, you know, the further north you get, the less likely it was to have, you know, the, these crazy rules. Interesting you say that, that I've just made you say, uh, because here's a map um, of who had what. Mississippi actually didn't even have a grandfather clause. They made everybody pay a poll tax and literacy test. But Virginia, Virginia, all right, which bordered Washington, D.C., all right, still, still does. Uh, they had a poll tax, literacy test, and a grandfather clause, all right? It wasn't just the Deep South. This was very common, and these laws are directly designed to keep African Americans from voting, all right? Uh, not only are they specifically designed to keep African Americans from voting, all right, uh, you would think that once this becomes obvious, these are official laws passed by the state. This is not secret, right? This is not, you know, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan is a terrorist organization coming out to, to terrorize African Americans at the time. That's absolutely happening. What we're really talking about here in this unit are laws passed officially by the United States government. The, the KKK is not a government organization, right? The government may not have done hardly anything for a long time, especially in the, in the 20th century, to stop KKK and their terrorist tactics against African Americans. But there wasn't a government-sponsored law expectation or an ideal. These were, these are government laws passed by the government to prevent citizens of the United States, specific groups, and this group African Americans, from voting, from having a voice in the government that's making the laws against them. If you would think, oh my gosh, well, I'm sure once this comes out, people will realize this is ridiculous and, and the federal government's going to step in and say, no, nah, you can't do that. Just like they did with the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. The federal government appears to just be tired of dealing with it. That's that's sad. I mean, it, I want to say it's wild. It's, crazy. it's sad. And here's how we know that, because while all those were getting passed, that's when Plessy versus Ferguson happened a Supreme Court case which legalized segregation to make, so it was separate but equal, but it legalizes segregation. And we had talked about this court case previously. So while these laws are taking place at the state government, they're basically getting backed up by the federal government. Like if you're an African-American at the turn of the century, who's got your back? Nobody. Seeing that, less than 2% of the African Americans in the South even register to vote. You can't vote, you have no control of your government, and these laws continue to exist, all right? And there's no change in sight at the time, all right, uh, at, at the turn of the century. So the question here is, explain how the grandfather clause, though it applied to everyone, directly targeted African Americans to prevent them from voting. So we talked about that in detail, answer that completely, pause me if you need to, and we'll move on. All right, so there is something that ha happens in the West, and this is there's a positive and negative with this, all right? So this isn't all 
completely negative for African Americans, but it still is going to put them at a disadvantage. All right, almost like, hey, there is no more slavery that is outlawed. We are at absolutely no more slavery here. But we're going to turn a blind eye to the fact that you have very little say so in your government now, even though you should. It's like literally a violation of the Constitution for you to have, you know, these rules in place to prevent you from, from voting. But there's just not this motivation to step up and help African Americans. So this is another example of that. All right. Uh, the United States government, after the Civil War, is trying to increase the population, have a larger food supply, trying to get people to move west. So the United States government comes up with this idea called the Homestead Act, all right, where they are going to give 160 acres of land to anybody that wants to pack up and move out west and be a farmer. Now, the reason they hadn't done this before uh, is because they didn't have the technology. There's two very important pieces of technology that had come out at the time that allows people to move out in the middle of the country and thrive farming and growing food, all right? Uh, windmills pump water out of the ground, which helps you irrigate your, your, your crops. You also have uh, John Deere here created the steel plow, which allows you to till up the soil out there. These steel plows were expensive, but they would basically last generations. These two things allowed you now to be able to mass produce food if you choose to in the middle of the country. So the United States government, anybody that wants to, well, they'll give you 160 acres of land. So from 1862 to 1886, this is actually starts in the Civil War and extends about 20 years after the Civil War. Uh, they will give land away to anybody that moves out there. Not just a little bit of land, 160 acres. Now, to give them out in perfect itty bitty little squares. And they, uh, uh, so this is an example of, of lots. So uh, you just sign your name, that's fine. Now the only requirement here, when they give you this land, is you will move out to the middle of nowhere and you have to farm on it, all right? As long as you farm on it for a certain amount of years, you're fine. Now, the United States government wants a bigger population. They need more food. Uh, so a lot of people that move out here, they want them to grow corn, they want them to grow beets, wheat, uh, they want to grow stuff that uh, the United States can then turn around and use for food foodstuffs. A lot of the people that move out here are going to be from the immigrants that are in the factory workers at the time, and we will talk about that in future lessons about the um, experiences of immigrants in the factories. A lot of people are going to move out here, uh, take advantage of the homestead act, or poor, uh, poor people from the south that are going to move out here as well. The problem is whether you're an immigrant moving here from a factory or you're uh, a poor southerner moving out here with your 160 acres of land, y you don't know how to farm food. If you're from the south, you know how to farm cash crops, tobacco, cotton. You don't know how to grow food. If you're an Irish immigrant coming from a factory, you know nothing about farming. So the United States government realizes this and they're going to add another caveat to this. Before we move on and talk about this other caveat, let me point out, I've specifically not said it, African Americans, freed slave, are allowed to take advantage of the Homestead Act. Blacks are allowed to sign up just like anybody else and get their 160 acres of land. All right, like, cool. I wish that was like the end of the story. I'm like, look, this is one thing they did right. This is cool and everybody's equal, moving on. Well, here's the issue with that that African Americans are going to face when they get their 160 acres of land. Since nobody knew how to farm food moving out here, the United States government knows that, and they have a second act that goes along with this that is called the Moral Land Grant Act. The Moral Land Grant Act, what this allows to, uh, uh, to happen, all right, uh, is that they will pay money to these states where people are moving to to build colleges. Colleges that will then teach the people taking advantage of the Homestead Act, how to grow food. Uh, probably the most uh, notable one here, uh, I'll point out, is the University of Nebraska, all right? That is the Corn Huskers, all right? Uh, th the Corn Huskers, University of Nebraska, is designed to basically teach people at the homestead, uh, that come out of their homestead, how to grow food. Like night classes, it's free. They have access to that. They teach them how to grow corn. So they get out there, they have their land, they're taught how to do it. They can grow food and that is their new lifestyle. Hooray. However, all these schools that are teaching people, guess who's ineligible to go to these schools? 
That's right, black people. So if you're a black person and you're a freed slave or you're African American or, or, or uh, whatever your identity is and you take advantage of the Homestead Act, you got 160 acres of land, but they're not gonna teach you anything when you get there. You're on your own and you still have to farm for a certain amount of years, otherwise you lose everything and then you're in debt. So you would think uh, that these freemen would be like, well, I can't do it then. That's not what happens. A lot of uh, slaves take advantage of the Homestead Act. They're actually called <coughs> exodusters, all right? <coughs> uh, exodusters move out to the, to the middle of the country, all right? However, they're not going to grow food because they're not taught how to. But they already know how to grow things. Specifically, what do they know how to grow? Cotton. Because that's what, uh, when they or their parents or grandparents were slaves at the time, that's what they knew how to do, and that was their skill set. So slaves moving out to the middle of the country had to uh, stick with growing cash crops. Typically, cash crops did not grow as well in the middle of the country. Uh, they had to come as far south as possible, like parts of Oklahoma uh, and uh, areas that will eventually be the Dust Bowl during the 1930s uh, for the warmer weather. So knowing the need to grow cotton, they can't move to Nebraska. They can't move to North Dakota because you needed warm weather to grow cotton and so it really limited where the, uh, the freed slaves could take their 160 acres of land at. However, a lot did because it, it's still free land and you're not working for somebody else with tenant farming or, and sharecropping, um, which is only like half a step really above, especially uh, a sharecropping, half a step above slavery in itself, uh, where you work for somebody else. It is at least your own land. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, some exodusters that have moved out there. The reason they're called exodusters is because, again, uh, African Americans, I say again, uh, uh, in, in US history, we're talking about the Second Great Awakening. African Americans have become very religious uh, when the Second Great Awakening happened in the early 1820s uh, because they were allowed to go to church. And they, at that point, realized, hey, well, like the Book of Moses, or the Book of Moses, the Book of Exodus, that talks about the story of Moses. Uh, when they become devout Christians, they realize, wait a minute, God basically sent Moses to get the slaves out of Egypt because the slaves were his people and God doesn't like his people to be slaves. We'll talk about it a good bit in U.S. history. But once they have their own land, the, uh, the slaves refer to themselves as exodusters. Basically, this is the promised land. Uh, and they take their 160 acres, and the reason they're called Exodusters is the book of Moses, where Moses freed the slaves and took them back home to Israel, is in the book of Exodus. So, complex story there to explain why they were called Exodusters. Uh, but the freed slaves who took advantage of the Homestead Act were Exodusters, even though they were not allowed part of the Moral Land Grant Act because they were black, they were not allowed to go to the all white universities that got built. Again, these are actual laws presented by the federal and state governments using taxpayer monies are still denying African-Americans who are still expected to pay the taxes to pay for those all white universities that they are not allowed to attend. Uh, but they do move out here, but they farm almost exclusively cotton, a skill set they already had, but it, it leads to different challenges because of where they are uh, and the amount of uh, uh, geography, weather that they deal with is not super conducive to growing cotton. Uh, so the question here is how did the Homestead Act and the Moral Land Grant Act put exodusters at a disadvantage to their white settler peers? Uh, so while they were given the land, why were they still put at a disadvantage uh, due to federal and state governmental laws? Uh, which eliminated the ideal of everybody's supposed to be equal. All right, once you get that, uh, we are done for the day and I'll see you guys tomorrow.